Secrecy can be a very powerful tool. It can obscure some of the most heinous acts from the public. It can make the most criminal enterprise look like a legitimate business operation. It can safely hide any amount of illegal wealth without repercussions. But sometimes, secrecy is leaky. And when the filth spills all over the floor for everyone to see, that's when we can notice something strange. In the face of undeniable evidence and the most severe charges, the same pattern repeats itself over and over again. In the world of dirty secrets, one nation does things better than perhaps any other around the globe. This nation has made it its mission to offer the absolute best of the best in financial privacy for a very special clientele. And it is from this nation that a leaker would spawn, who would blow the loudest whistle in the country's history. This is the story of the most corrupt bank in the world. In September of 2001, when nothing else of significance was going on, a British banker was arrested for skimming $12 million from celebrity clients in the Monaco branch of HSBC. Half of the siphon money came from Michael Schumacher, a top Formula One driver. The rest came from the other 19 similarly rich and high-profile clients of the British bank. This incident was an embarrassment for HSBC, a financial behemoth looking to serve the richest customers around the world. To quickly recover, the management hired a new systems engineer to secure the bank's internal networks. The man chosen for the job was Hervé Falciani. After securing the Monaco branch, HSBC was so happy with the results, they transferred Falciani to a much larger branch in Geneva. At first, the satisfaction was mutual. Falciani arrived to Geneva in 2006 and immediately undertook the new challenge. But then, one faithful day, things would go full 180. As he was working on a new customer relations management system, Falciani stumbled upon a security vulnerability. The bug started dumping all of HSBC's sensitive information, bypassing any access controls put in place to prevent such a thing from occurring. Hervé could see full customer names and account numbers, confidential notes from staff meetings with clients, everything that could lead to sensitive banking information of the most high-risk clients at HSBC. Soon, Arve realized he didn't just have access to one system, he could see the whole kingdom, which became evident to him when he was able to find a file on himself. This is where Falciani should have reported a vulnerability to his superiors, so that an internal security team could patch it up, but instead, he began collecting the data for himself and his branch colleague and mistress, Georgina Mikhail. It's not exactly clear how this heist transpired, but in the end, Hervé and Georgina had their hands on the list of some 130,000 clients at one of the most secretive banks in the world. Their true intentions are not certain to this day. According to Georgina Mikhail's testimony, Falciani initially wanted to sell the data to one of HSBC competitors. Falciani, on the other hand, framed Georgina as a double agent and that he was blackmailed by Mossad to sell HSBC's data to their client. Whatever their original motives were, this is what eventually happened. Falciani and Mikhail took on a trip to Lebanon, where they found a client interested in the data. They booked the tickets using Falciani's wife's credit card, and Hervé took on a fake identity of Ruben al Chidiak to sound more Lebanese. Hervé and Georgina told the client they ran a legitimate data brokering business and that they got the bank's data from legal open source intelligence. But the Lebanese client was suspicious of the true legality of the data. Instead of purchasing it, they quietly reported the incident to the interbank alert system. In the security bulletin, they described a man named Ruben al Shediag traveling with his associate Georgina Mikhail with what appeared to be private client information from a Swiss bank. Looking at Georgina's real name, it wasn't hard to figure out which bank this security bulletin was of concern. HSBC was alerted. When Falciani and Mikhail returned to work in Geneva, they were questioned by their superiors at HSBC. 
Falciani denied any involvement, but Georgina spilled the truth. At this point, Falciani was on the run, and when the bank officials went back this time accompanied by police to arrest him, he was already headed towards the French border. Upon request from Swiss authorities, the French police arrested Falciani and were ready to hand him over to the Swiss. But when questioning him, Falciani decided to bargain. He offered the police all of the information he just stole from HSBC that he claimed contained enough evidence to collect billions of euros in back taxes by the French government. In exchange, the French police would offer Falciani protection. And so, the deal was sealed. The stolen data were decrypted and the Falciani list was sent to France's finance minister, Christine Lagarde. Holy cow! The false analyst uncovered incriminating evidence of a global scheme that enabled tax evasion of about $180 billion in just a few months. People on the list were known arms traffickers, drug smugglers, blood diamond traders, and dictators. Among them were somewhat less criminal members of the political and economic elite, celebrities, and sports stars, all trying to hide their assets from the public and many even from their local tax authorities. The schemes revealed that HSBC wasn't just an unwitting vector, they were proactively implicit in them. The bank developed several methods to help their clients hide their assets. One of them was to simply use the strict Swiss secrecy laws to protect their clients' assets from the jurisdictions of the clients' local authorities. But this wouldn't be enough for those with not-so-legitimate intentions. So the bank came up with a scheme they called hold mail accounts. A holdmail account was a service offered to wealthy customers that would function without any correspondence of any kind going between the client and the bank. If a client wanted to make a deposit, they would physically meet their account manager in a public place and hand over cash in an envelope. Account holders would then use burner phones to receive confirmation of their deposit, but the clients would have no documents of any kind that would attest their account ownership there would be virtually no paper trail left that could tie an account to its owner. As many as half of HSBC clients would select the hold mail account service. Still, there was yet another arrangement that would enable similar level of secrecy. This scheme was more corroborated in the Panama Papers in which HSBC was also implicated. According to this scheme, Rather than opening accounts in their names directly, clients would be advised to first set up anonymous offshore companies and then open accounts at HSBC in their name. The bank would then help transfer their funds to the anonymous accounts to prevent them from being traceable to the real names of their owners. This method worked so well even HSBC top executives took advantage of it to hide their wealth. HSBC was very successful at attracting the highest value clientele from around the world. The list didn't contain just some random millionaires and businessmen. The Swiss bank accommodated the very top of the world's ruling elites, from royalty through oligarchs to dictators. Among them were the King of Morocco, the Crown Prince of Bahrain, and dozens of members of the Saudi royal family. There was a Turkish businessman, sanctioned by the US, for supplying goods to Gaddafi's regime. Listed was also a Russian billionaire associate to Vladimir Putin, who was sanctioned at the time in response to Kremlin's annexation of Crimea. Documents once describe a British billionaire called Richard Kering, who once withdrew 5 million Swiss francs in cash. They also uncover a number of multi-millionaire donors to the Clinton Foundation, some of whom were reported to have won favors for their donations. The leaks also confirm HSBC moved millions for an arms dealer who was named by the United Nations as financing the bloodshed of the Burundian Civil War in the 90s. There was almost 2,000 names of people involved in the diamond industry, including those convicted of dealing in blood diamonds. HSBC had known about an investigation into one of their blood diamond clients, yet they still opened offshore accounts to help him evade authorities. HSBC also serviced at least three people from the so-called golden chain list of 20 names, linked directly to Osama bin Laden from Al-Qaeda. And as the greatest irony in human history, HSBC banked with the Interpol's most wanted and also with the president of Interpol's foundation for a safer world. Some of this was leaking to the press. Leaks that happened at the outskirts of the global economic recession. The public, the tax authorities, and the media were all outraged. HSBC was grilled, questioned, and investigated. 
But did any of this actually lead to anything? HSBC has fallen short of our own expectations. HSBC did not live up to our own expectations. Well, let's take a look at how governments dealt with these damning revelations. Let's start with Greece because how they dealt with this was utterly hilarious. The original doc sent to Athens contained about 2,000 Greek residents, but the first finance minister who got the list didn't recommend any prosecution. During the later reshuffling of the cabinet, a new finance minister claimed the list was lost. When Greek authorities requested a new copy from Paris, a USB flash drive with a copy of the list suddenly resurfaced from a drawer of the minister's secretary. But when compared, names of the minister's relatives that figured on the original were missing from the copy. But nobody took it seriously. Out of the 2,000 names, only 10 were given to prosecutors. In 2012, a Greek magazine hot dog somehow obtained all 2,000 names and the editor decided to publish the full list. To say that the Greek public was outraged was an understatement. Finally, the prosecution decided to step in, but the only person they arrested was the editor who published the list for violating privacy laws. As for the tax evaders on the list, the Krieg authorities concluded that no investigation will take place since the information on the list was obtained illegally. The case was closed, and other than that, two people from the list were found dead by suicide within five days and a quarter of the globe from each other. In the rest of Europe, the situation was none the better. In Spain, the government collected 260 million euros from 650 tax evaders, but no legal action was taken against the HSBC itself. In the UK, out of the 61 billion dollars deposited in HSBC, only 135 million pounds was recovered, and only one person was prosecuted. France did charge the bank, but before things went to court, a law was conveniently passed in 2016 that allowed the bank to settle without trial. So HSBC only needed to pay 300 million euros and never admit to any guilt. Switzerland also charged the bank, but the fine was only $43 million, which was less than what some of HSBC clients held on their accounts. Falciani himself was prosecuted by the Swiss authorities and was sentenced to five years in prison for aggravated industrial espionage. It was the harshest sentence ever in the history of Swiss bank secrecy laws. In the United States, the fallout from the Falciani list surprisingly led to the most severe consequences for HSBC. The revelations ignited a further probe into the bank's operations, which found HSBC laundered at least $7 billion for drug cartels. The government immediately issued a fine of $1.9 billion, which was more than any other government's action resulted in. But at the time, HSBC had about $2.6 trillion in total assets, so... <laughs> Yet even here, not a single person was charged. Instead, the bank and the government signed a five-year deferred prosecution agreement, in which HSBC had to promise to do better in exchange for not facing any charges. Since the five years have long passed, did the bank actually do better? Well, the bank did so badly that the independent monitor who was sent to oversee HSBC doing better grew so frustrated with the bank, he just gave up and blew the whistle on everything. Their revelations became known as FinCEN files and have been largely publicized by most reputable journalistic publications. In these files, it was found HSBC continued moving hundreds of millions of dollars for Latin American drug cartels. They helped a bunch of Brazilian kleptocrats move $31 million from stolen government funds. They continued doing business with clients in money laundering investigations. And they helped Russian oligarchs by moving their assets to the West, wiping their slates clean. The bank was found to have processed billions in transactions while filing reports with incomplete information about them. Despite these findings, the US government decided to do nothing and concluded the whole saga by letting HSBC go free without any prosecution. So, what's the moral of the story? There's actually a lot to learn from this. The HSBC rom-com reaffirms that it will always be the whistleblowers who will get punished for exposing the wrongdoing. 
not the wrongdoers themselves. But we already knew that because we've seen this exam playbook happening since the Vietnam War. We all live in a fantasy world where we pretend we are all equal under the law, when in fact there are double standards in everything. There are multiple systems of criminal justice, and there are multiple systems of taxation. The government seems to be way too eager to go after the tax returns of the working class, but it willingly turns blind eye to multi-billion dollar international schemes. It seems incomprehensible to even suggest that enablers of tax evasion and money laundering clients should be punished, or that a clientele above a certain wealth threshold should face any repercussions. It's almost as if massive financial fraud was a feature, not a bug. Meanwhile, you are being told if you are a good boy or girl, are honest and work hard enough, you too will make it to the top. When nobody actually at the top plays by the same rules as everyone below them. Banks, the super rich, the international criminals, they all know they can get away with it because they know the proletariat is in no mood to do anything about it. The justice system won't stop them, the law enforcement won't investigate them, the legal system won't regulate them. Now the question is, will the working class do anything about them? One thing you can do is to support independent investigators and explainer videos like this one by donating to my Patreon. Making these video essays takes a tremendous amount of time and effort, which my YouTube ad revenue doesn't appreciate at all. At this point, I'm virtually dependent on your support. So, pretty please?